Just like, yeah. do you want to be in the Instagram page with me? Yeah, we can be outside. Thanks, Claire. Yeah. Um, so, uh, welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. It's great to see my students, and like, it's so you look so different. <laughs> it's just not in the classroom. I barely recognize you. Massive shorts. <laughs> I wanted to bring forth the summer vibes. I love Good. Good I love for you. Thank you. So, welcome everyone. Not in my class. All the students, and faculty who are here, and it's a real. Uh, Pleasure and honor to introduce um, Professor Regine Jean Charles. She's a professor in Africana Africana Studies Department. Um, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about her biography and why I'm so excited that she is here. So Professor Jean Charles is a, a Black feminist literary scholar who uh, works at the intersection of race, gender, and justice. Her scholarship and teaching in Africana Studies includes expertise on Black France. Sub-Sahara Africa, Caribbean literature, Haiti, and the diaspora. She's the author of a number of books, including Conflict Bodies, The Politics of Rape Representation in the Francophone Imaginary, as well as Other Worlds, Black Feminism, Literary Ethics, and Haitian Fiction. Her most recent book is called A Trumpet of Conscience for the 21st Century, King's Call to Justice, which I think just came out last year. She also publishes widely for more mainstream publications like Ms. Magazine, the Boston Globe, WGBH, America Magazine, etc. So those of you who know me know that my focus in PPE has always been on justice, and particularly the way that race, gender, violence all intersect with how we understand what a just economy and a just political system is which is why I'm so delighted that Professor jean Shell could give us this talk for our class, but as well as part of the PPE speaker series, to really help us to highlight these issues and see the connections between her work and the things that we're doing in our classes and in the PPE program. So Professor jean Shell will speak for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then there's going to be lots of time for questions and answers. So I encourage you to take notes, write down your thoughts, and um, really think of it as a question and answer Think of the questions and answers as for you, as what you're interested in. Maybe connect to things we talked about in our classes as well, or in your other classes. So, Professor Jean Charles, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Oh, there's water here for me. How nice. So I don't need this enormous water bottle. Okay. Well, actually, I probably should be more. Hi, everyone. Good after, where are we? Morning? Morning, right? We're still morning. Good morning. 15 minutes till afternoon. How are you doing? Are we awake, alive, ready? Yes? Hi, friends on Zoom. How are you? All right. Well, thank you so much, Serena, for the introduction. Um, it is, uh, I remember when I was interviewing for my position at Northeastern and you were very good at talking about um, the things that are exciting about Northeastern and I was looking forward to having you as a colleague so I'm glad that we can finally do something like this in person and it is always a pleasure for me to speak to students this semester especially because I'm not teaching so it's nice to see, you know, some warm bodies in the classroom. <laughs> All right, well, I have um, a talk today. The title of my talk is Do Something Transformative, Black Feminisms and Social Justice. And I really do hope that this talk inspires you to do something transformative, especially as the semester is ending, right? You have one week left in the semester, and hopefully the things that you've learned in this class and in your other classes throughout the semester aren't just going to leave you and fly out of your mind, right? Hopefully all of those things and this talk that you hear today will inspire you to really make a change and uh, what is it that they like to say at Northeastern, to be an impact engine, to be your own impact engine in the world. 
go ahead and advance my slides a little bit. Let's do this way. There we go. The title for this talk comes from an interview with the Black feminist literary scholar Guggenheim Fellow and inaugural chair of African American Study of the African American Studies Department at Columbia University, Farah Jasmine Griffin. Fun fact: Farah Jasmine Griffin will also be giving a lecture here at Northeastern on Tuesday at 5 p.m. in the Cabral Center. So this is a quotation from an interview she did with Ms. Magazine. Discussing the legacy of Black feminism today, she declares that, quote, Black feminism has never only been about Black women. It's never been this. It's been about a more just world and a planet that said, if you listen to the insights of the least of these, which is often us, that we can do something transformative, end quote. Black feminism has never only been about Black women. Black feminism is about a more just world. Black feminism is about a planet that said, if you listen to the insights of the least of these, we can do something transformative. When you parse the distinct, part, the distinct elements of her that make up her statement, which conceptualizes a lucid vision for what Black feminism is, we notice that first, Black feminism is radically inclusive because it includes Black women and everyone who has been marginalized, whether because of race, class, gender, sexuality, or ability. Two, that Black feminism is primarily concerned with justice. It's a social justice project. Three, that Black feminism involves attention to the entire planet. For my climate justice warriors, this is an important thing for us to remember. Lastly, Black feminism empowers us to do something transformative. So I want to take this vision, succinctly articulated by Griffin, as an invitation to meditate on the social justice origins of Black feminism and to consider the new directions in which that vision of justice is moving in the 21st century. As a social justice project, Black feminisms are deeply invested in possibility and world making. The idea of world making stems from an investment in imagining the possibilities for Black life. The imagination is the beginning of making in every form. In his essay, oh, where are my slides? Hi, everyone. Sorry. We'll catch you up. I just want to advance this. Be the fastest way to advance these slides. Sorry. All right, there we go. What is called the imagination from image, magi, magic, magi, magician, etc., is a practical vector from the soul. The imagination is the projection of ourselves past our sense of ourselves as quote unquote things. Imagination, image, is all possibility, because from the image, any idea is possible. Possibility is what moves us. This is a quote from Amiri Baraka. While I find Amiri Baraka's definition of the imagination very useful for my purposes here, his framing of revolution is not explicitly feminist, despite the fact that he had no shortage of Black feminist counterparts. Black feminism's investment in possibility, imagination, and revolution has been expressed by writers like Nikki Giovanni, who in her poem, Revolutionary Dreams, presents a speaker for whom the imagination is a projection of herself that opens new possibilities. The speaker of the poem is ultimately moved by possibility. Revolutionary Dreams by Nikki Giovanni. I used to dream militant dreams, dreams of taking over America to show these white folks how it should be done. I used to dream radical dreams of blowing everyone away by my powers of perceptive and correct analysis. I even used to think that I'd be the one to stop the riot and negotiate the peace. Then I awoke and I dug that if I dreamed natural dreams of being a natural woman, doing what a woman does when she's natural, I would have a revolution. As a college student, I was obsessed with this poem by Nikki Giovanni. The simple epiphany revealed in the concluding line, quote, if I dream natural dreams of being a natural woman, doing what a woman does when she's natural, I would have a revolution, was prominently displayed on my email signature. I was notorious for this while in college at the University of Pennsylvania. 
It captured what I perceived then as my own fraught positionality, a budding black feminist committed to black student activism who was not always convinced that I could be both for the revolution and for feminism. As a Haitian American college student, majoring in African American studies with a minor in women's studies, I loved how the poem expressed the union of these different fields as well as the tensions between them. Here, Nikki Giovanni outlines a liberatory prise de conscience of a woman who begins with a narrow perception of radicalism, then grows to understand that simply by embracing her gendered identity, by leaning into her race and her gender, rather than trying to be someone who adheres to facile notions of what it looks like to do something transformative, she could further advance the revolution. By using the past tense, Giovanni denotes two phases of development, a past and a present, the latter ostensibly informed by the former. Moving beyond where she was before, where she used to, allows the poem's intrepid speaker to achieve a more complex, more complete, nuanced, and balanced understanding of radical politics. These radical politics are unabashedly feminist. It is equally important and instructive that the poem's speaker suggests that the potential for revolution lies not only in the ability to act, but in the ability to dream. In fact, dreams are necess necessary for transformation. The transformative power of dreaming bursts with meaning and possibility. Dream your own dreams, the poem encourages us. Pay attention to your dream, the poem teaches us. The incantation of I used to dream, followed by iterations of political work that is intellectual, spiritual, and activist, discloses just how dreams cannot be deferred, short-circuited, hijacked, or counterfeit, unless they are our own. The poem's conclusion suggests that perhaps it is not the breath of the dream that matters, but rather the ability to dream in and of itself that moves us to do something transformative. Revolutionary Dreams also reminds me that so many of the issues preoccupying Black feminists, such as justice, gender, sexuality, race, class, and personhood, correspond to words like freedom, revolution, and possibility. I take inspiration from the poem's title, Revolutionary Dreams, and use this idea of dreaming as a mode through which we can imagine different versions of ourselves in the world. The poem evokes the politics of a Black feminism flourishing. This politic can flourish because it accounts for the losses and limitations of militancy that is only racial as opposed to intersectional. In the poem, we hear the echoes of a failed Black power movement that restricted women's, women's roles to nothing more than being prone. The freedom dream allows Black feminists to imagine a world where liberation becomes possible and realizable and is more complete than other models of racial progress that did not accommodate the idea of multiple oppressions. This freedom dream allows us to imagine a world free of social injustice, sexism, racism, homophobia, patriarchy, AAPI hate, Islamophobia, economic injustice, environmental injustice, religious fundamentalism. The list is long because the injustices are many. The freedom to dream allows us to imagine a world in which none of this injustice is present. Dreams invite us to access something beyond language, the space where imagination and vision reign, where anything is possible. Because the freedom dream is often the first step of our justice work, the, revolu the revolutionary dreams can be the foundation of Black feminism. But the idea of revolution is far from simple. As Frances Beale wrote in Double Jeopardy to be Black and Female in 1972, 60 years ago, the frame of revolution is not to be taken lightly. Quote, Beale writes, quote, we must begin to understand that a revolution that only, not only entails the willingness to lay our lives on the firing line and get killed, in some ways, this is an easy commitment to make. To die for the revolution is a one-shot deal. To live for the revolution means taking on the more difficult commitment of changing our day-to-day -day patterns, end quote. Living for the revolution, the speaker of Giovanni's poem with her lowercase i, commits to examining and transforming her day-to-day -day practices just as Beale instructs. 
Revolutionary Dreams also resonates with the framing of Robin D.G. Kelly's book, Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination, which he opens with a rumination on how his mother passed on an ability to dream incandescent dreams. Kelly's mother was formative in his own life as an intellectual precisely because of her commitment to and determination to dream. He writes, quote, my mother taught us that the marvelous was free and the patterns of a stray bird feather in a Hudson River sunset, in the view from our fire escape, in the stories she told us. She simply wanted us to live through our third eyes, to see life as possibility. She wanted us to imagine a world free of patriarchy, a world where, where gender and sexual relations could be reconstructed. She wanted us to see the poetic and the prophetic and the richness of our daily lives. She wanted us to visualize a more expansive, fluid, cosmopolitan definition of blackness to teach us that we are not merely inheritors of culture, but its makers, end quote. This maternal figure sounds to me a lot like the woman that Giovanni conjures, the one who had learned that simply being a natural woman doing what a woman does when she's natural can inspire revolution. A woman who understands that dreams are the beginning of revolution. Kelly goes on to argue that he, to explain that he, ever his mother's child, believes that, quote, the map to a new world is on our imagination and what we see in our third eye rather than the desolation that surrounds this, end quote. Now, Kelly wrote this book about, 20, it was in the early 2000s, so almost 22 years ago. And it's really striking to me today as I think about the desolation that surrounds us, right? When we're living in a pandemic, or as one of my colleagues said yesterday, the pandemic reconstruction. <clears throat> Kelly proudly attributes the evolution of his own freedom dreams to radical feminists of color, including his mother, who reveal how race, gender, and class work in tandem to subordinate most of society while complicating easy definitions of universal sisterhood or biological arguments that establish men as the enemy, end quote. Both Kelly and his mother remind us of the necessity of dreams to create spaces of possibility where freedom can reside. Indeed, dreams are, feminist to, are central to Black feminist praxis for the ways that they allow us to imagine different, better, more just, and more free worlds. Dreams can be identified as the necessary first step because that has characterized black feminism, because since its inception, the simple desire for equity across race, class, gender, and sexuality has been a defining feature of black feminism. When we understand the black feminist imagination as a space where we can imagine a world free of patriarchy, a world where gender and sexual relations could be reconstructed everywhere, we understand the necessity of dreaming in its articulation. And of course, dreaming is the first an essential precursor to any social movement of any kind. And dreaming is the first step. For example, dreaming is the first step it takes to create a field like Black Studies or to create a movement like Black Feminism. Acts of the imagination inspire and undergird acts are creating, organizing, writing, and theorizing. Black feminism is propelled by imagination. Toni Morrison instructs us, quote, as you enter into positions of trust and power, dream before you think, end quote. I love this quotation by Morrison so much because it is a reminder of the power of the imagination and its necessity for making in every realm, even if you're entering into the corporate world. By instructing us to dream before we think, Morrison cautions people in positions of trust and power to never neglect their imaginations. Dreams, by their very definition, enable, equip, and energize our imaginations. Perhaps in no small part due to my training as a literature scholar, I am the utmost believer in the imagination as an animating force that can teach, empower, and activate. When we deploy our imaginations, we begin to see the world differently. In order to do something transformative, we must allow ourselves to be truly visionary. Oh, why is that there? Sorry. According to Bell Hooks, quote, to be truly visionary, we have to root our imagination in our concrete reality while simultaneously imagining possibilities beyond that reality, end quote. As a Haitian American woman, I come from a people who had to imagine a world without slavery in order to be free. 
Black feminism thus mobilizes the power of the imagination to have a transformative impact. As the quotation from Farrah Jasmine Griffin framing this talk proposes, because we are rooted in the lived experience of Black people all over the world and committed to imagining more just futures for all, we have the potential to transform the communities in which we live. Feminism in general asks us to imagine what other worlds are possible. It also invites us to build them. As Sarah Ahmed writes in Living a Feminist Life, quote, if we become feminists because of the inequality and injustice in the world, because of what the world is not, then what kind of world are we building? To be clear, Black feminism has always been a social justice project in theory, in which theory and praxis are one. Griffin's directive to do something transformative conveys the politics that undergird Black feminism. The most radical forms of Black feminism rest on the premise that politics are inherent to what we do. <clears throat> the founders, oh, sorry, you missed that one. It should be truly visionary. That was a good one. <laughs> the Kamba River Collective. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about origins, right, and these social justice origins that we find in Kamba <clears throat> So the founders of the Kamba River Collective and the authors of their famous Kamba River Collective Black Feminist Statement, a manifesto expressing the roots of radical Black feminism, make this much clear in their trailblazing statement. The statement is instructive, not only as one of the first articulations of a radical black feminist politics, but also because it is a manifesto or a statement. As a manifesto or a statement, it can serve as a movement building tool. And so I always tell my students whenever I teach this, this is such an important statement for people to read and to understand that what they're saying is they're defining their politics, right? They're giving us a method of organizing. They say, this is what we believe, right? So I always say to students, you know, as you're organizing, you have to be able to state, this is what I believe, right? You have to be able to explain, this is why I believe what I believe. And they also tell their own origin story. They explain out of what, what the Comedy River Collective emerged, right? So this is a group of black feminists, lesbian black feminists that existed from 1974 to 1980. And this group is so important to us, especially in Boston, because this is a group of women that was founded in Boston. And it was founded because of the murders. There were 13 women that were murdered in Boston, and there was no press about it. And there were, let's see, 12 of the women were black women, and one of the women was a white woman. And so this group of feminists decided to organize around, um, organize in response to the murders of these women, right? Which again, think about it. This is, you know, over 40 years ago, right? And so this is kind of the same trajectory that we see when we have a say her name movement that comes in the 20th later on in the well in the 21st century actually because that was the 20th century okay so consider for example the first sentence of their statement quote the most general statement of our politics at the present time would be that we are committed to we are actively committed to struggling against racial sexual heterosexual and class oppression and see it as our particular task the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. End quote. <clears throat> For Kambahi, an active commitment to struggle against these forms of oppression could not only exist in theory. It had to be put into practice. Here also, their politics stem from the, their lived experience and fierce commitment to the lives of Black women. Quote, our politics initially stemmed from a shared belief that Black women are inherently valuable, end quote. Kambahi, which was created in Boston in 1974 when a group of Black lesbians began organizing in response to the death of 13 Black women, is an example of how Black feminism operates as an intellectual and activist project. Describing the origins of this collective, Kianga Yamada Taylor offers, quote, equally dismayed by the direction of the feminist movement, which they believe to be dominated by white middle class women, and the suffocating masculinity in black nationalist organizations, they set out to formulate their own politics and strategies in response to their distinct experiences as black women. But they were not only reacting to the deficits found in organizations led by white women and black men, they were also inspired by the national liberation and anti-colonial movements from the Algerian struggle against the French occupation to the Vietnamese resistance of the American war. 
The CRC, the Combahee River Collective is called the CRC, saw themselves as revolutionaries whose aspirations far exceeded women's rights. They aspired to the overthrow of capitalism, end quote. So seeing themselves as revolutionaries, together they imagined a more just world and committed to actively creating it. Their commitment to action is even events in the name, Kambahi, right? C-O-M-B-A-H-E-E. -E. Has anyone heard of the Kambahi River? Yes. Have you heard of the river or you've heard of this river? I've heard of this river. Oh, um, so it's named after a raid that was led by Harriet Tubman in 1863. And it was a raid that Harriet Tubman led that freed 750 enslaved people. It was the only military action led by an enslaved woman in the United States. So they chose that name, right, um, because it, it, it expressed the action. Combahee um, presents a model for, and a method for organizing. As black women, quote, they say, as black women, we see black feminism as the logical political movement to combat the manifold and simultaneous oppressions that all women of color face, end quote. More than 50 years later, their words still remain important. Recent current events. Oh, that's, that's the, oh, so the, the slide right before that, actually, those were the Smith sisters, they're twins. Bever Bevy Smith and Barbara Smith, and they're two of the founding members of Combahee. That was them at a march in uh, 1979, I think it was, I can't remember the year. And then this is another, you know, there's, it's interesting because when you look at like the photos of Combahee, it's almost all either photos of them protesting in, in, in marches or photos of them in these very kind of intimate pictures where they had a press called the Kitchen Table Press too that came out of it. Um, so just like collective reading groups, right? Which I think is really interesting to think about in terms of the work. Okay. So can you skip this? Recent current events help us to confirm that these dynamics are still in play. Take for example, their observation that quote, black women have always embodied, if only in their physical manifestation, an adversary stance to white male rule which we witnessed, end quote, which we witnessed prominently on display a few weeks ago during the confirmation hearings of Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. The work of the Cumbahee River Collective remains relevant today as an example of radical black feminist politics for which the goal was always to do something transformative. So we're two years away from the 50th anniversary of the, state, of the founding of this organization um, and the field of black feminisms continues to expand. So now, uh, so it, it, again, Kambahi represents really an origin story. I mean, but I think it's so important for us to remember that black feminisms has existed, right? People thinking about race and gender and justice together has existed long before we had official statements like the one that the Kambahi River Collective made after they were founded in 1974. And they were founded in 1974, but the statement came out in 1977. So Michelle Wright, the scholar Michelle Wright observes, quote, at each crucial stage in African-American history, black feminists were often the ones looking at questions of justice and equality more deeply and broadly than were many of their counterparts, end quote. By taking an intersectional view of social justice projects, black feminists were able to address multiple forms of injustice simultaneously. The simultaneity of oppressions, and this just means that, you know, oppressions are linked, that characterizes black feminism steadfastly espouses a both and approach. So during the 1970s and the 1980s, for example, pivotal texts like this bridge called My Back, All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave, Home Girls, an anthology, Black Feminist Anthology, and Zami, A New Spelling of My Name, gave voice to black women's lived experience of racism, sexism, and misogynoir. This efflorescence of black women's writing represented a watershed moment in which constant creativity, study, and critique became markers of a burgeoning black feminism. The 1970s also marked the time that we have Shirley Chisholm in the middle there, who was the first um, black woman to run for president. Um, the 1970s marked a time, an increase in black feminist organizing due, to the, due in part to the tensions that inflamed during the women's liberation and civil rights movement. By this time, queer black feminists were becoming more openly and visibly positioned within black feminist groups. Organizations such as the Salsa Soul Sisters, one of the first out and explicitly multicultural lesbian organizations, emerged as a result of tensions with straight black feminists, as well as the white, gay, and lesbian community. 
Um, I also should also note that this was also during the time that, you know, we have here this picture of Angela Davis right there in the middle, right? This was also the time that Angela Davis um, was put was imprisoned, right? And, you know, when you hear Angela Davis speak or when you read her writing, you see how formative this experience was in terms of her development as a black feminist. I should also note here that my use of black feminisms in the plural is an embrace of capaciousness that attends to how much our field has evolved. In its plural form, black feminism helps to articulate the capaciousness of what it encompasses. Angel Davis puts it this way, quote, I rarely talk about feminism in the singular. I talk about feminisms. And even when I myself refuse to identify with feminism, I realized that it was with a singular kind of feminism. Oh, there we Definitely. go. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I do want us to kind of, I want to pause to give us a few definitions, right? So that we all have some kind of common language, right? So we know that feminism in general can be described as the, the struggle to end sexism, sexual exploitation, and sexist oppression. And that's a definition offered by Bell Hooks that I really like um, from 1989. But 21st century black feminists have continued to build upon and expand these definitions. So for Kianga Yamada Taylor, for example, black feminism is a guide to political action and liberation. In her popular book, that's the last quote there on the bottom. In her popular book, Hood Feminism, Mickey Kendall writes, quote, the hood taught me that feminism isn't just academic theory. Feminism is the work that you do and the people who you do it for who matter more than anything else, end quote. Kendall goes on to note that my feminism is rooted in, a, in awareness of how race and gender and class affect my ability to be educated, receive medical care, gain and keep employment, as well as how these things can sway authority figures in their treatment of me, end quote. So Mickey Kendall's book, it's a very, um, it's a popular, it's a, you know, with a popular press, it's a trade book. Uh, I highly recommend it, though, because it kind of reminds me, she's writing in the same vein as Bell Hooks would write, right, where she's re really writing for any audience. And I think especially if you're interested in the topic of economic justice today as it relates to black feminism, she goes really deeply into that and what it means. Um, for example, you know, she has some examples in there about health care, but also, you know, what does it mean to be a black woman living at the, intersec at the intersection of marginalized identities when you are a parent and you are food insecure or you're a housing insecure, right? So she, it's, a, it's a really good book that I, that I recommend um, for that reason. So using her lived experience as a point of departure, Kendall's vision of black feminism as a social justice project dwells on how injustice shapes her daily life and the life of the black women around her. Indeed, dissolving the binaries between theory and praxis has been a definitive characteristic of this work. These texts show us. So while the term black feminist was not in circulation until the 1970s when Kumbahi penned its statement, the concept of black feminism, that racial and gendered identity, in, excuse me, that racial and gendered injustice are inextricable from one another, has been conceptualized by activists and thinkers at least since the 18th century. It's not probably before. Black women activists, journalists, and writers such as Ida Wells Barnett, Mariah Stewart, Frances Harper, Pauline Hopkins, laid out far more inclusive projects for a Black future. Later on, in one of the first, and these are just some of the, again, figures that we really should think about in terms of history who were pioneers, right, visionaries of Black feminism who, you know, may not have called themselves Black feminists. I always say this about even someone like my grandmother who was born in 1917. She never called herself a feminist, but she certainly was, right? She certainly believed um, in the equality of gender. She certainly had uh, oh, an analysis of race, class, gender, and sexuality that was born of her lived experience and that she really applied as a lens um, to everything that she did. But these are, you know, some people, and even, you know, someone else that I think is important that we, we don't talk about properly enough um, is, is Ida B. Wells, right? So even if we look at Ida B. Wells, we've heard of Ida B. Wells as the anti-lynching activist, but we have, we, only, I would say in the past maybe 20 years, scholars have really begun to explore the ways in which Ida B. Wells' work was, she wasn't just fighting on behalf of, you know, black men who are the victims of lynching, but that she had an analysis, right, of how gender played into the problem of lynching as well. 
Later on, in one of the first full-length books to define and describe Black feminist theory, the sociologist Patricia Hill Collins delineated six distinguishing features of Black feminist thought. In Black Feminist Thought, Knowledge, Consciousness, and Power, that was written in 2000, Collins elaborates Black feminism as a social justice project. Defining social justice movements as collective work against oppression, Collins proposes that, quote, as long as Black women's subordination with intersecting oppressions of race, class, gender, and sexuality, and nation persists, Black feminism as an activist response to that oppression will remain needed. In Collins's view, the purpose of Black feminist thought, or US Black feminist thought, is also to resist oppression, both its practices and the ideas that justify it. So once again, we see all throughout this theory and praxis. As a critical social theory, Black feminist thought aims to empower African American women within the social context, the context of social injustice sustained by intersection, intersecting oppression, end quote. Collins's work is instructive because it charts a through line from earlier thinkers, activists, writers, and intellectuals, ranging from Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, Anna Julia Cooper and Ida B. Wells, who exemplify a commitment to approaching social justice with an intersectional lens that understands how these oppressions are multifaceted and linked. So in other words, long before Kimberly Crenshaw became famous for using the term intersectionality in the 1990s, Black women throughout history advocated against racial injustice and gender justice in a way that acknowledged their interconnectedness as well as the other forms of oppression um, that they were subject to. And I want to just pause again to remind us of the definition. I think this is actually one of the best definitions of intersectionality um, because it's one that Kimberly Crenshaw actually gave while she was doing an interview with, it's either Time or Newsweek, I forget. I think it was Time and it was, Mm, it was the before times of the pandemic, so it might have been 19, it might have been 2019, <laughs> not 1919, it might have been 2019 or like early 2020. But so she says this, she says, intersectionality is a lens. It's basically a lens, a prism for seeing the ways in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. We tend to talk about race inequality as separate from inequality based on gender, class, sexuality, or immigrant status. What's often missing is how some people are subject to all of these, and the experience is not just the sum of the parts. And it sounds like from what Professor Parekh was saying at the beginning of class, this is something that you've talked about a lot, right, in relation to um, economic justice, that you have to have an intersectional lens when you, when you discuss it. And to work against it, right, not just to discuss it, but when you're organizing against it. So for Collins, this transformative vision of social justice is also global. And this is something I write a lot about a lot in my work because um, you know, the book that I have coming out in the fall is on uh, Haitian, it's on three Haitian feminist authors uh, who live and work in IEC. And um, the idea that black feminism is also a global project, right, is something that was always, always a part of it from its inception, but I think has become a little bit lost to us, especially in the 21st century. So this is what Collins says. Collins says that since black women cannot be fully empowered unless intersecting oppressions themselves are eliminated, black feminist thought supports the broad principles of social justice that transcend US black women's particular needs, end quote. I can't emphasize this enough because it means that again, we have to think about, you know, Audre Lorde says everything is interconnected, right? Our freedoms are linked is another way of thinking about it. And so when we talk about um, a feminist solidarity, it's a feminist solidarity that has to transcend the lines of the countries that we live in. <clears throat> Our, as as um, Bear Jasmine Griffin tells us, black feminism has never only been about black women, right? <clears throat> and so lastly, I wanna use, um, well, not lastly, but lastly for this section, <laughs> Collins's definition of a social justice project, I think will be instructed for us too. She calls it, quote, an organized long-term effort to eliminate oppression and empower individuals and groups within a just, within a just society. Collins emphasizes the different ways that black feminisms refuse to capitulate to a logic according to which specialists within the academy are the primary knowledge producers and innovators of black feminist thought. The union of activism and scholarship defining black feminism serves as another vehicle through which we can understand it as a social justice project. The centrality of activists and privileging all forms of knowledge production is a black feminist principle to which we've long adhered. Now what did I do? 
This is why it's good to have someone click through a slide for you. All right. <clears throat> So now this part, we're going to talk about, so I, I spent a little bit of time talking about the origins of black feminism, right? We had Cumbahee River Collective. We saw examples from people from different centuries. And of course, we talked about Patricia Hill Collins's um, book as one of the first to really lay out black, what black feminist thought means, right? And talk about the distinguishing features in which she repeatedly talks about it as a social justice project. She says that is one of the features of it. Um, and so I want to think about the 21st century examples, right? So here we have three books. I'm not going to be able to talk about all of them, sadly. But these are three books that all came out within the past year, within the past month for some of them. America Goddamn came out earlier this month. It's by the historian Truva Lindsay. Abolition Feminism Now came out a bit earlier this year. And Unapologetic, I think, came out last year. So um, upon the strength of this unwavering foundation, 21st Black, black feminists and Black feminist academics and activists are pushing the field into new reductions with new directions with meditations on black feminism that refuse to reduce black fem black women's experience to the sum of race and gender. Even more, we are theorizing black feminisms to make space for gender expansive and non-binary people who have been afflicted by racialized and gendered oppression. Two decades after uh, Collins' black feminist thought. More recent studies like uh, the Princeton professor Imani Perry's Vexy thing on gender and liberation, Jennifer Nash, Duke professor, Black Feminism Reimagined After Intersectionality, and <clears throat> Angela Davis's Gina Dent and Beth Ritchie's Abolition Feminism Now. Most recently, the historian Treva Lindsay's America Goddamn, Violence, Black Women in the Struggle for Justice. These books are presenting examples of Black feminism's continued insistence to anchor its vision in social justice. By addressing themes like the affects associated with black feminisms and how the term intersectionality has circulated in the academy for better or for worse, that's Nash, refocusing our analyses on the need for a more pointed attention to the structures and strictures of patriarchy, that's Imani Perry, or an ethic of care devoted to the harm meted out against black women and girls and gender expansive people, that's Lindsay. Or, as Davis and Dent do, take on the abolitionist nature of feminism and the feminist dimension of abolition. These studies amplify the significance of black feminism today as a freedom making project. I wish I had time to talk about how each of these books is advancing social justice, a social justice project that does something transformative, but I will only focus on one example today. So our example is America, goddamn, violence, black women, and the struggle for justice. Again, this book just came out and I highly recommend it. Feminist historian, in America, goddamn, black feminist historian Treva Lindsay initiates a discussion about anti-black racial violence that centers and cares for the experience of black girls and women. Focused on how and why gender mattered and continues to matter in operations and practices of anti-blackness, Lindsay offers a historical analysis of the violent harm black women, girls, and gender expansive people experience in order to lift the veil off of the suffering and say her name. Oh, sorry. That's, I see. I, I, did I? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I keep, this thing keeps moving and then I don't look. That's the problem. I think the keys on the keyboard, the left and the right, can also help you navigate. The it is. It is. Yeah. All right. We don't have any. So Lindsay offers a historical analysis, right? So what, what Lindsay is doing with us is she's saying her name. And maybe I'll play the video afterwards, after the end of the talk. Um, so the ethic of care with which Lindsay researches and writes America Goddamn acknowledges that, quote, black women and girls have always been at the forefront of struggles for justice, end quote. In so doing, she holds space for black women and girls as both victims and resistors. Lindsay powerfully captures how the experience of multiple jeopardy equips marginalized people with a more clear vision for transformative justice. She writes, quote, being multiply marginalized can contribute to the emergence of multiple consciousness for justice. To understand how we are multiply situated as devalued and disposable opens a possibility for struggling for justice in more robust and effective ways, end quote. This is a reminder of what Fannie Lou Hamer said, nobody's free until everybody's free. Lindsay's work demands that we not only, that we not erase the violence being meted out against black women and girls, especially in the Black Lives Matter era, where anti-blackness is popularly understood in terms of the violence, of how violence impacts cisgender 
black men and boys, especially in their death. Hers is a cry for justice that stretches far back centuries, recognizant of how luminaries like Anna Julia Cooper, Mariah Stewart, and Ida B. Wells paved the way for black feminist thought. It also points prophetically to black feminist futures unfurling with possibility. Possibilities that begin with dreams inspired by the imagination. Despite its rumination on anti-blackness, violent harm, and traumatic death, America Goddamn is ultimately a book that calls us to do something transformative. And I can't say enough about how important this book is because she talks about mass incarceration, she talks about police violence, she talks about domestic violence and sexual violence. And she does so in a way though, that is very attentive to um, the interventions that are being made, especially by black women and girls um, to end these forms of injustice, right? And so I think sometimes what happens is that we get a voyeuristic or spectacular view of these um, of black suffering and of the injustice that's happening that doesn't pay attention to this kind of long struggle that black people have always been engaged, black feminists especially, I would say, have always been engaged in to end this harm and this violence. Lindsay's social justice vision espouses a both and ethic that holds life and death, suffering and joy together. When she attests, well, I'll just give one more example from the book. So the last chapter of the book is a letter that she writes to Micaiah Bryant, who was a, a woman that was killed, a black woman, a black girl that was killed by police in Columbus. And this is again, an example of how we have this historian an academic, right? That is using an archive um, that includes examples of, you know, black women and girls being killed over the centuries. Um, and that is also using her own lived experience and her own kind of processing of that grief to see Micaiah Bryant be killed in the city that she lived in and tr switching up the form, right? And so I think, you know, for me as a writer and someone that thinks about literature, this is really important to think about too, is what does it look like on a page to write about social justice in a different way? Um, so when she attests, quote, I remain steadfast in my belief in the collective power of oppressed people to change the world. More than that, I believe in our ability to make new worlds, end quote. She invokes a vision to work towards a more just world that not only listens to the insights of the least of these, but also follows their lead to build a better world. And finally, by way of conclusion, I want to end with another book that is, I've just been thinking about so much lately. And this, see, this is what happens when I'm not I'm not teaching and I've been giving all these talks and doing all this writing and I'm like oh but I have to add this and I have to add this um this book black aliveness or a poetics of being by Kevin Quashie it is a book that argues for theorizing blackness that foregrounds life and abundance rather than lack and death so this is a really important new direction um in light of the haunting omnipresence of anti-black death that has characterized the lives of black people and the work of black studies especially in the past two decades the book is just beautifully written, um, and it's an illumination of light and life as a force that animates Black feminist cultural production, politics, and praxis. And so Kwashi identifies as a Black feminist thinker and a Black feminist theorist, and he takes inspiration from Black feminist authors, poets mostly, and essayists for this book. His inquiry is nothing short of a communion with Black women's writing in which he lovingly pours over poetry and essays by Black feminist authors. Using these works as his guide and a method, he argues that, quote, black women writers' works, some familiar, some not as often read, are a generative source through which we can find and affirm black aliveness. He disavows schools of thought like Afro-pessimism, diverts our attention from the exhausting and all-consuming spectacle of black death, and flies in the face of overinvestments in black pain, suffering, and trauma. His study is an eloquent affirmation of the fact that anti-blackness is a part of blackness, but it is not all of or what blackness is, end quote. Or as Imani Perry puts it, quote, racism is terrible, blackness is not, end quote. So with Black Feminist as his guide, Kwashi takes us through this poetics of aliveness in the most black feminist of ways. One of the, book, one of the book's first examples conceptualizing aliveness is a letter in which the black feminist theorist Barbara Christian writes to Audre Lorde and she says, quote, can I just tell, can I just say again how alive your being makes me feel? It is an invitation 
to come and celebrate, as Lucille Clifton writes in her poem. It is a jubilant declaration of what Nikki Giovanni writes in her poem, Ego Tripping, when she says, I can fly like a bird in the sky. And so I want us to extend Kwashi's invitation for Black aliveness to think, as we think about justice, what is it about the work of social justice that makes us feel alive, that makes us think about aliveness? What does it mean to begin uh, rather than from a place of lack uh, and a place of desolation, to begin from a place of abundance um, and a place of joy as we think about justice work? And what does it mean um, to imagine a future in which freedom, liberation, care, and love do not just coexist, right? They are not just a part of our thinking, but they're what propels our thinking forward. In a vein very similar to Farajaz and Griffin's call for us to do something transformative, similar to Nikki Giovanni's revolutionary dreams, similar to Robin Kelly's freedom dreams, Black aliveness asks us to look for other worlds. As Kwashi explains, quote, Black feminist thinking might be specific in naming Black women, but its ambition has always been the breath of being alive, the principle that the lived experience that of the one who is Black and female is comprehensive enough to manifest totality, end quote. And the final quotation from that book that I just love so much, and I'm like, I'm just going to give this as a gift, as an offering. Um, he says that this vision, he describes it and he says, we are not the idea of us not even the idea we hold of us. We are us, multiple and varied and becoming. The heterogeneity of us. Blackness in a black world is everything, which means that it gets to be freed from being any one thing. We are ordinary beauty, black people, and beauty must be allowed to do this beautiful work. To me, this is exactly what it means to do something transformative. It is to do work that is difficult and beautiful, work that holds death, and that holds life, work that longs for, dreams of, and attempts to build a more just world. Thank you so much. Do you want to use the question, or do you want to just call on people? Well, you know their names, so yeah, maybe we yeah. should. <laughs> no, go ahead. I mean, you prefer... Yes, go ahead. Um, hi, my name I met you before, yeah, and now you came to my other talk. That, uh, What's your name again? Vish. Hi, Vish. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you Again. Um, <laughs> um, so I actually have two questions, but you can like skip from me and come back to me. Um, you touched on the idea of uh, seeing black women um, and black girls at the forefront of these movements. And it, within organizing spaces and within these movements, we do see women of color and black women carrying a lot of the burden of activism and a lot of the burden of these movements. So what are your thoughts on that in terms of, you know, sustainable activism and preventing emotional burnout, empathy fatigue, um, in terms of, you know, being able to make serious change in a sustainable, um, in a sustainable way? I feel like someone asked a very similar question when we gave that talk, when I gave that talk about my, my book um, in that room wherever we were. Um, but. This question always, this question often comes up is my point. And so I love this quotation by Angela Davis where she says, somebody asks her, it's in her book, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, which was written like two years ago. Angela Davis is like in her 80s, right? Like Angela Davis is not a young woman anymore. And somebody asked her like, well, how have you managed to sustain this life of activism for like, you know, over 70 years or something like that, over 60 years? And she says, it is in collectivities, it has been in other people, and I'm gonna kind of mess up the quote, but she says that I have been able to find reservoirs of hope, right? And so I have this talk that I gave called Reservoirs of Hope, in which I talk about this idea of that reservoir being something that you draw from in order to help you in doing your work. But that reservoir is made up of coalitions, right? It's made up of people. It's made up of the friends that are going to like organize with you. I do a lot of organizing, local organizing in the town that I live in, we have a big election coming up on Tuesday. And you know, this is something that we talk about all the time because sometimes people need to step back, right? Um, so that someone else can step forward. Sometimes people need to 
tell people that they need to step back, right? Because they're like, oh, you know, you don't look so good. And so I think it's really in relationship and building that so much of organizing is about the relationships that you have with actual people, right? So when you have, when you tend to those relationships with an ethic of care, that will allow you um, to be able to be kind of vulnerable, to be able to say like, you know what, I'm tired, I can't do this, and that's fine. And I think we also, especially as women, women of color, have to allow ourselves to be okay with taking a break, right? Like that it's not, the, the, the weight of the world does not have to be on our shoulders. We don't have to solve it all, right? That there's work happening, there's work happening everywhere all the time. Um, and so I think that removing some of that burden, when you, when you are in a collective, um, that that is one of the ways that you can remove that burden. I'm also a big, big, big believer in self-care, in things like retreats, in, like I said, stepping away. Um, I remember when I was at, previously, before coming to Northeastern, I was at Boston College for 13 years, and I remember I had this one student who decided her senior year that she wasn't going to lead any organizations, right? And everyone was shocked, because she was like, you know, had been doing all these things. She was like, I'm tired. And I'm like, that is fine. That is great. I wish more students would do that, right? That it's okay to take a break. Um, and that there are different types of things that will feed you, and going back to the reservoir idea, that are necessary to replenish you, even in your organizing, right? So maybe you're going to take time off from leading the organization or organizing the marches, but you're going to spend that time reading Kambahi. You're going to read Abolition Feminism, right? So there are other things that you can do that are still allowing you to be able to invest in the work later, but that don't necessar aren't necessarily so depleting in the moment. I hope that's okay. But, you know, they say, what was it? I mean, that's why I love about the Kambahi River Collective. Um, because there's this idea where they say that, you know, black women, we have always defended each other. We have always supported each other. We have been the ones when it felt that we were disposed or not cared for, that we did that work for one another. And it is those collectivities that allow us to kind of um, be able to continue in the work. Yes, go ahead. Tell me your name too, please. Um, hi, my name is Jonike. Um, so you spoke a little bit about achieving solidarity specifically with uh, women and different countries and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how women who live in like the global north can achieve that solidarity especially women of color who are oftentimes like immigrants or you know uh, disconnected in some way from their like ancestral roots so how like in the 21st century do you think we can go about finding that solidarity mm. so this question is so complicated by COVID right because you know, I think about my own work, and I'll just speak from my own experience as a Haitian American um, who was raised, you know, here in the U.S. And my parents immigrated from Haiti. And my work, you know, I'm very intentional about not just working on Haiti, but working in Haiti, right? And so my parents have moved back, and so that gives me the ability to go back pretty often. Um, but I have, you know, been able to forge relationships with women who are leading organizations, who are leading feminist organizations, anti-violence organizations who are there, right, with other women scholars who are feminists um, who, are, who are also doing the work there. And that has been a very, very important to me in terms of maintaining those connections. One of the ways that you have to do it is also by um, being, uh, being multilingual, right, depending on what the space is, because you know, there are spaces in which, like, the, they'll only be speaking Creole in the meetings, you know, or, and I have to know, if I want to read some of the archives, I have to be able to read French, to know French in some spaces. And so I think that students, well, this is something that I say as a, you know, a previous language professor, um, that we have to also pay attention to how language is, is a tool that kind of is going to help us in our solidarity movements, right? That sometimes if you're going to, if you're if you're gonna organize, let's say you're so in Haiti we have a lot of like economic justice that focuses on rural women. You can't go and work with those women in those spaces if you don't speak the language, right? So I would say like language, you know, paying attention to language and thinking about what other language skills do I need to acquire in order to do this work with folks that are on the ground, these organizations. And then also, I mean, you you all are lucky too because there's so much in terms of the internet and connections and digital spaces. Um, some of the, the, the like younger feminist organizers that I know, again, this is COVID, that I've met more, more recently, it's through Twitter, it's through social media that we've met each other, right? Um, when I talk about the organizer, the Haitian women, Haitian feminists. Um, but I think, you know, being aware of that positionality too is, is always, is always the first step, right? No matter what, like when you, you're, you and you're, uh, what do they call it? Not just like acknowledging your privilege, but also spending your privilege too, right? So 
how can I use the resources that I have access to as a Northeastern professor to sow into some of those organizations that have far fewer resources, even, you know, universities. One thing that I did when I was, um, when I, so I, at Boston College, I taught French. I taught in French in addition to teaching in English. And I taught a lot of classes on Haitian literature. And I have a friend who's a professor in Haiti, and she was like, oh, I'm so jealous that you get to teach all these classes because, like, we don't have access to the books because a lot of the books, the books um, that aren't, the books that are being, a lot of the, oh, how do I explain this? Not a lot, but there's a fair number of presses that are French presses that are producing books by Haitian authors, right? And um, they're just really expensive. It's like $30, like, and so what I started doing was with my students at the end of the semester, they would donate their books at the end of the semester. And then whenever I went to Haiti, I'd always come with this box of books and I would bring it to the library. Um, well, I'd give it to my friend who would then put it in the library where she, um, at the university where she was teaching. And even a small thing like that, like she's like, oh my gosh, like now I can actually teach this because I have these other books, right? So you would be surprised by a small, you know, talk about spending your privilege, a small gesture like that is, a, is an act of solidarity, right? It's an act of solidarity because it says, well, what, what are the things that I have that you don't have access to and how can we work together to create access? And it also goes back to relationship, back to my, my previous point, because if I didn't have a relationship with this person, we wouldn't have, been, we wouldn't have had the conversation where she told me about the books um, and we wouldn't have come up with this idea together. Tell me your name, please. Nasser. Hi, Nasser. Uh, so you mentioned like uh, pandemic reconstruction earlier in the presentation. Um, I was just wondering, like, what role do you think uh, black the black the black feminist perspective plays in this reconstruction, and what do you think this like black feminist uh, post pandemic world would look like? Oh, okay. Thank you for that question. So that was my colleague India Lork Wilmot, who's um, a professor here at Northeastern uh, in sociology, actually, and. India, yesterday we were in a faculty meeting and I said, you know, I was leading the meeting and so I said something like, I don't even know what to call it anymore. Like, is it the long pandemic? Is it the, you know, because we're not post pandemic, right? So what are the words? And so she said, oh, it's the pandemic reconstruction. And I was like, oh, that's so smart. Because, you know, if you just think about what that period of reconstruction meant, right? Where we're like, slavery is really not over yet, right? So anyway, um, so I think, that black feminists are so, we're so, I mean, the, if we had a black feminist world, some of the losses of the pandemic would not have had to be so, right? If we had an intersectional approach to justice, even like health justice, right? Then we would have been more attentive to how the pandemic was going to affect us. And I believe fewer people would have died, right? if we had taken you know, measures that valued all of the lives equally. I think that there are a lot of black, there are black feminists doing work in particularly in the health sciences, um, in areas like uh, economic justice, in areas like, well, medicine, obviously. Um, I think that they have some insights for us in terms of how we can just create more justice, right? In these, in the, in like in healthcare, right? Just as an example. Um, I also think, what did you say? What was the second part of your question? What would a post pan, post pandemic? Oh, uh, what does like a black feminist post pandemic world look like? Oh, yeah. That's such a great question. I don't know. I mean, I'd say, I, I like, I don't know about the post pandemic world. I have a hard time with the post. It's almost like post colonial, right? like the post and post colonial. Um, I don't know. I mean, if we go back to like Farah's quotation that I used to start this. So the idea that if we look to the people that are most marginalized and listen to them, she didn't say that, but I add that, um, then we could create more justice, right? So let's think about, I mean, I'm not going to answer the question, but I'm going to put another question to you for you to think about, though, is so what, as we imagine that future, who are the people that are the most marginalized that we need to focus on and listen to in our post-pandemic world? I mean, I think we know, right? 
Go ahead. All right. Um, my name is Oledan for Aziz. Um, I couldn't be more grateful for the report you finished with uh, Renal Diake, of our study on Diake, that we, all of us, we are our political and we're them becoming, right? Um, writing a paper in my philosophy of race and racism class with um, Professor Adam Hussein and my, the title of my And Professor paper, Patricia Williams, yes. too, I hear. Yes. Uh, the title of my paper is Beyond the Limits or Within the Boundaries of the Present White Case. So I'm drawing from my experience as an African immigrant in my search for identity in the United States. And I kind of talk about how like, um, the descendants of enslaved people find it harder to find an identity because it, there is, it's really difficult to, because their identity has been stripped, you know, in the beginning when they were brought here as slaves, right? And then a lot of people try to find identity by maybe leaning onto Africanness and maybe going African and say, oh, I connect to Ghana, or leaning to whiteness so they can be accepted in America. But what happens is for anyone who takes both paths, still feel confused because it's hard to find identity in the United States because most of the identity has been defined by whiteness. So I wonder what the black, um, you know, the black feminist perspective is in the struggle um, for identity by um, the descendants of enslaved people in the United States. Well, where are you from originally? Nigeria. Nigeria. Um, what a fascinating topic. So here's the thing. I think you should read Imani Perry <laughs> first. Um, I also think that when it comes to, so what, what was resonant, what was, what came to mind as you were describing this is kind of my own background having done African American studies, right? And thinking about all of the things that African Americans have created, right? That are popular all over the world, right? Things like blues, jazz, hip hop, right? Um, and so I don't know, so I don't, think that, I think what is amazing and what I admire so much about African-American culture is that innovativeness and that ability to create something, like create a culture that is, I mean, hip hop culture is copied all over the world, right? Out of supposedly, so if, if they're saying, so to me, I don't see it as a lack in terms of the identity, right? Because I'm like, well, obviously they were able to create something out of this culture, right? So that's enough, that's like a longer discussion for a, another day. Um, I think that what black feminists would say about identity too is that, you know, when you're talking about black feminism, you always want it to go back to a both and, right? It's never, it's not going to be an either or. So it's not like, well, either you're choosing to create your identity based on this or you're choosing to create your identity based on that. It's going to be, okay, so we understand, this is what I also love this quotation and the idea of aliveness. So if we, if our point of departure is not a place of lack. How do we then think about what it means to create an identity and to be a people that are kind of forward looking into freedom or that are that are kind of dreaming, right? Having these revolutionary dreams like Giovanni or imagining freedom. Like how is our identity constituted in a way that's like future oriented? Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm making any sense, but no, I think I am. But so if we're, we're not so kind of locked into this idea of identity of it having to be either this or this, but what if we kind of take the accumulation of those and then say, well, what, what, what have we created with those identities? And so this is where, for me also, this is why I'm a literature scholar and I like to use poetry, right? I use film, I use novels, um, visual art also, I think is one of the ways that we can get to this question that you're asking about about black feminists. But you know, when it comes to identity also, and you talk about the in the context of black feminisms, I would encourage you also to go back to Kambahi, the Kambahi River Collective, where they talk about identity politics, right? And that term, which has also been misused um, over the years. Um, if you go to the original Kambahi River Collective statement, as well as a book by Kianga Yamada Taylor called How We Get Free, there's a really good discussion there about black feminism as it relates to identity politics, which I think will be helpful for you. Um, and I love the idea of identity politics as opposed to one fixed identity, right? This is also what Kwashi is saying. It's the heterogeneity that we, we get to be freed from being any one thing. And so I'm always thinking about black feminism as a freedom making project in which we want that to be the goal. We want people to just be free to be 
right? And not have to say, not have to stake their identity on one thing. Good luck with your paper. <laughs> yes. Um, like as a scholar, how, how do you like keep your work accessible to those who don't have like I, I in your talk like I mean I'm having a tough time keeping up and I'm in this class so I'm thinking like many people don't have access to like higher education in general so how do you try to like center those people in your work since those are the people most impacted by the yes talk thank about. you for that question so I have different talks for different venues too it's funny because she was like this is first year students and I was like uh oh <laughs> I was like I didn't I thought you all were seniors. <laughs> oh, there's some questions in the chat, maybe. Um, yes, language. Oh, Emmanuel Pascal. Oh, Pascal Auguste. C'est cousine moi. Pas chouchou, is that you? That's my cousin. <laughs> hey, I'm here. Allo, chérie, qui joye. Oh, femme, moi là. Non, tu es vous. I am muted, you pas chouchou. This is my cousin that is, you know, in 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 Port au Prince right now. But um, this is the other thing about social media, right? Because I didn't write to her to invite her in my talk, but I did post it on Instagram. Um, and so I think that there that there's you know possibilities there. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of examples. So you know, the book that I wrote in the fall, the book that I wrote that came out in the fall is a trade book, The Trumpet of Conscience Today, and it's very you know, Laura Green called it like my bell hooks, written in the spirit of bell hooks, very accessible language. We're not using words like dialectic and simultaneity. Um, and I really wrote that book for a very general audience. I also give talks in different venues. Um, I've given talks at community centers, for example, which will be very different from the talk that I would give to a class that I thought was full seniors. <laughs> or a class that I would give at an academic conference, right? And I think that that is you know, again, part of the work that we do, but I think it's also important, just like I talk about the importance of being multilingual, you have to be um, multi, what is that, discursive, I guess? You have to be able to, you have to be able to speak, you know, in different, different contexts. Like when I give a talk at my church to the youth, you know, to the teenagers in my church, it's very different. It has the same concepts, right? Where we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about black feminism and I'm gonna give them the definition um, but it's not, you know, but it, it's in a different kind of discourse or a different kind of place. If that makes sense. And even, you know, when I talk to my children, also, this is something my, my youngest daughter, she's six, and she'll always be like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll explain it to her, you know, and I'll say it in a different way. So that's good. Ch children, they do keep you on your toes in that way. They're helpful in that regard. We have no questions. I have time. one more question. If, yeah. Um... <laughs> Heterogeneity. Oh, look, that's still a question. So sorry. No, go ahead. I'm listening. We have no questions here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This is another Haitian person, Gabriel Jean Louis. Okay, sorry. I just have one more question. So else yes, that's fine. Don't, um, don't ever apologize for asking questions. Yes. Okay. You, oh, y'all no, remember no, you before. Me. You have the apology problem. <laughs> it's because I came in the last 15 minutes and mm -hmm. I felt so bad. Mm -hmm. um, I take it back. Um, <laughs> we recently also read this book in class. It's called what, by Heather McGee. It was The Sum of Us. And yes, we went to high school together. But <laughs> Heather, she's a year behind me. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and she, she does the thing where a lot of like more modern authors are doing where they... Um, include their personal experience and their lived experiences in order to make their point. And I, I think it's great. I think it's a great way people can relate to um, the authors. I'm just wondering how, um, how like the glorification of one's trauma or like the, um, you know, people, people need to capitalize off the trauma to make a point sometimes. And I, because I, I, I've definitely had that experience before as well. I'm just wondering how, if there's a, if it's possible for us to, you know, have people listen to us, have people empathize with us, um, while not having to put that, like, emotional trauma out there every time. So the first book that I wrote is about rape culture, right, conflict bodies. And this was a question that I thought about a lot. Another, I remember I was at a conference one time and a, a, a Haitian scholar who's a sociologist, she was like, Haitian women cannot be reduced to their identity as rape survivors. 
or rape victims is what she said. And I agree with her 100%. And I think, again, with the both and, I, so what should I do then? Should I not acknowledge that sexual violence is happening, right? I actually even prefer the term. This is one of the reasons why I developed the term victim survivor as opposed to just uh, a victim or just a survivor, to acknowledge kind of both parts of that. Um, and I think that this is a danger, this is a problem that only people who have been minoritized and marginalized have to wrestle with, right? Because we're not really given the freedom to just be. We're not really allowed to just be free. To just, you know, do what Kevin Kalashi says. To be freed from being any one thing. And so we put the trauma out there, but then we're afraid, am I only going to be defined by the trauma? Which means, which is because we're not, we don't feel free to be any one thing. As someone that has worked so much with survivors of sexual violence and in the movement to end gender-based violence, um, and taught classes on rape culture, wrote a book on rape culture, I think what is most important is to center the experience and with the comfort of the person whose story it is. So if the person is comfortable sharing their story, then who am I to say, no, no, you should stop sharing the story. I also think, and my hope and my prayer for survivors is that they would feel empowered to talk about the trauma when they want to and to not talk about it, right? I was just on the phone with a friend who was talking to me about, she's like an incredible, she's a pastor in New York City and she is an incredible preacher, an incredible thinker, and she's thinking about writing a book for the first time. And she said, <clears throat> she has all these ideas, and she said, well, if I write this book about that, if I write this book first, if this book comes out first, then I'm going to be known as this person, this person that always works on this. And I was like, well, what makes you think you can't, you know, I didn't say this, but as I'm talking to you now, I'm thinking about another answer for her, is you can always push back, right? You can always, you know, when you're on Good Morning America and they say, oh, you wrote that book about, you wrote that book about rape culture. Like, let's talk about rape culture. You can say, no, actually, this is the book that I'm, what I'm working on now you know, is what I'm here to talk about. So I think that it's important for people to feel empowered. And this is why I love, you have to read America Goddamn, Treva Lindsay's book, because she really walks this line in a very beautiful way. She talks about her lived experience. She talks about the trauma. She talks about the suffering. But she does so in a way that also is kind of centering a belief in freedom, right? A belief in that this does not have to be the sum of us, right? To go back to the title of Heather's book. Yes. Oh, the two of you, like, at the same time. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, so given that black feminism is, like, inherently intellectual and, like, act, uh, like, part of activism, how do you think black feminists should navigate a political space with institutions that, like, are causing their oppression? Like, do you believe in, like, I guess, reform versus abolition through, like, a black feminist lens? I believe in abolition. I believe that we have to tear down the system and build it back up. And I think that that's the only way. And we were joking, where was I recently? I think I was again in a different faculty meeting where we were talking about burning it all down, right? And somebody made a joke like, just let me retire before you burn it all down, right? Um, so I think that, you know, this has been, a, I know for me how I navigate it is not by only remaining within the academy, right? So it's very important to me. A lot of my, uh, Serena didn't read this as part of my bio, but a lot of my um, activist work in the movement to end gender-based violence has been with an organization called The Long Walk Home, which uses um, the arts to end violence against women and girls. And they do things like, you know, working with youth, right? Um, youth organizers. Um, to empower them to kind of lead social justice movements against gender-based violence in their own communities. And, you know, I remember when I used to go, and it's it's a summer program in Chicago, but just even like, I would always go for like a week or a few days. And even that time, it just shifts your perspective. Like, these are girls from like the west side of Chicago. I don't know, anyone from Chicago here? No? No. These are girls from like a very under-resourced urban environment, right? And it's just, I mean, the stuff that they say, just everything, just being in their presence just is sh shifts you, you know what I mean? Um, I think it's important going back to being multilingual. I think it's important to travel in a number of spaces outside of the academy. I think some people, though, we do need people 
to me to, to stay in the academy to do the work, you know. Um, and I'm really grateful, you know, I think about Swarthmore, they have a, a um, Val Smith, she's a black feminist scholar, and she started out as a professor at Princeton, she's the president of Swarthmore now, right. And so I don't work at Swarthmore, so I don't really know, but I do often wonder like, huh, what would it, how does a university where a black feminist is the president feel different, right, than a university where, you know, a capitalist or, you know, whatever, a Jesuit priest, like where I was before, is the president. How does that feel different, you know? Um, yeah, and then there's been a lot of great stuff also written about this, right? So I think that, you know, in even Jennifer Nash's recent book, Black Feminism Reimagined, talks about this kind of, the fraught relationship between women and gender and sexuality studies and even black studies and the academy, right? Because again, just like, you know, Robin Kelly talks about this, that black studies, Africana studies, is a field that actually began, it was never meant to be just of the academy, right? That it was always supposed to be this project that was this in and out. And so there's a series of really wonderful essays that I can point you to that talk about this tension and the different ways that black scholars have navigated it. Yes. Um, so how does like black feminism, like how does the black feminism perspective sort of interact with like the immigration or first gen activism, especially as like seen in like PWIs for the kind of So I think that again, because it's intersectional, right? And the idea is going back to like what Farah says, if you think about people who are marginalized, um, that it would encompass all of those struggles, right? So, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer, nobody street till everybody's free. So that you would it would it would necessarily encompass it. Um, it would necessarily encompass people who are first generation um, and people who are, what was the other thing that you asked? You said, did you say immigrant? No, what was that? Immigrant, thing? yeah. Yeah, 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 who are immigrants. So in my book that's coming out in the fall, I write a lot about black feminism in relation to Haiti and Haitian feminism and why I chose to use the term black feminism um, and not only use Haitian feminism because part of what I want to do is remind people that black feminism from its inception was supposed to include, it was a global movement. It was supposed to be a solidarity movement, right? At the time, there were a lot of people calling themselves like third world women, right? So when we say black feminism, we're saying this is a movement for third world women. And so when you adhere to that vision, that's really what it's supposed to do, right? Yes. Um, so going off of Jonathan's question, um, for you as an Oh, well, I really, you know, remember my work is, my work is in the movement to end violence against women and girls, right? And so I have seen too much violence, especially against teenage girls between the ages of 14 and 17. So black girls, so in the United States, black girls, you know, when you look at an issue like teen dating violence, Black girls are like four times more likely to be victims of teen dating violence. Um, when I think about like missing and murdered indigenous women. So for me, my view of violence stems from that. And I just, yeah, so I would say, you know, I was like, am I a pacifist? We were having this debate in another, <laughs> with some of my colleagues in women, gender, and sexuality studies. Um, some people were like, I'm a pacifist, I'm a pacifist. Um, but I, I, I stand firmly against the violence, right? And I'm Haitian, remember, right? The Haitian Revolution. Violence was necessary to wipe it out, right? Franz Fenelon writes about this in colonial movements. And so I understand the necessity um, in times of, you know, upheaval or crisis to create something like the Haitian Revolution in the context of also that time. But for me today, whenever I think of violence, I mean, I think first about gender-based violence. I think first of rape. I think first of domestic violence. I think first of incest, right? I think I've been interested, it's been, not interesting, it has been heartbreaking to have to see all this coverage of the war in Ukraine, right? And knowing also for me that there's, there's war happening in a lot of other places too that we don't see a lot of coverage of. I would love to see more about what's happening in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, for example. But my mind always immediately goes to the women that are going to be raped as a result of this, 
right? So like, I can't, I literally like can't see a soldier, like the uniform of a soldier without thinking of a woman being raped. And so I think because of that work, and that's really where my allegiances and my politics lie and who I do the work, so much of the work for, um, it's very difficult for me to say, to like um, make a declarative statement about like being in support of violence. Thank you. But you should read Fennel. Do you read Fennel? Okay. And you should read Emma Césaire, too. People read Fennel, but they don't read Emma Césaire. Discourse on Colonialism. It's a good one. They go well together. Any other questions? Does anyone on Zoom have a question that you'd like to? Like, I see nothing in the chat, but. Hello, Janae. Hi, Candice. I feel like my cousin just invited all her friends to this. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Oh, gosh. Professor Del Moss has written a book on uh, non-civil disobedience. Ah, so, OK. Thank you. Uh, well, if there aren't any other questions, I just want to say what a great way to wrap up the semester. And for my students, we have one more class on Monday. And I invite you to think over the weekend about this question that Professor Jean Charles posed to us. How can we use our knowledge and our imaginations to envision justice? Like, where do we go from here with all of the things we've grappled with and thought about, and the lack, the, the problems we've dealt with? What, what is the, how, what do we fill it with? How can we go forward from here, both on a societal level and on an individual level? And so, with that, please um, join me in thanking Professor Jean Charles for such an incredible. <laughs> and for all the wonderful questions. I'm very easy to find at Northeastern. If you go to the Africana Studies page, my face is like right there. So feel free to email me. Come take visit me class. downstairs. Take a class yeah. in our program. I'm teaching a black feminism. Oh, I forgot to make my plug. I'm teaching, <laughs> if you like what you heard today, I am teaching Black Feminisms 101 in the fall. So you'll have a head start. Um, there are, thanks to Claire for organizing this talk, and there are sandwiches and cookies that are available, I guess, just around the corner. So I invite you to stay, socialize, chat, build community, tap into the, build those reservoirs of yes. community together. Thanks to the reservoirs. And thank you to Ricardo, our students, for helping out as well. I mean, like, I'm gonna have to take it eventually. I still think it's a Oh, Monica is here. I don't even know who is here. So, we have an Instagram that is Sorry, okay. okay. It's just. Yeah, I think she does. <laughs> that's the best way. I yeah. think that's how a lot of organizations do now. Not, no listserv. No, exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hi. You know, um, do you have your stuff? What's it's Northeastern Sark. Sure. Yeah. Sexual yeah. assault. Responsible issue. Uh, it's Northeastern. Yeah. Appreciate it. I'll be back in just five minutes.